terrific. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Again, this is Richard Mollett with the Long-Term Care Community Coalition. Today's program is one that I'm very interested in, and I hope will be interesting to you as well. Uh, we're talking about where does the money go, uh, providing some insights and some consumer perspectives on nursing home profits and losses. As always, this program will be uh, posted on our YouTube page. The presentation for the program is already up on the website, uh, in addition to a lot of other information, resources, and data at nursinghome411.org. And Dara Valenajad, who is going to be presenting with me today, is working on, with me on getting this uh, cast as a, uh, oh goodness, now of course, <laughs> this is how old I am, I forgot what we're calling it, as a uh, podcast. Sorry. So uh, we're going to start hopefully podcasting these in the future as well, perhaps even with this one. We'll see how that goes and start to look at it. But without further ado, we're going to get started. Uh, as usual, I start with a little house, a few housekeeping items. First of all, everyone's on, on mute. Uh, if you uh, have a question at the end, and we will leave time for Q&A, you can press star six to unmute or you can type in a question at the, in, in the box and um, either Sarah will read it or I'll read it. Uh, a little bit about the organization, the Long-Term Care Community Coalition. We're a nonprofit organization. We are entirely dedicated to improving care and quality of life for residents in nursing homes and assisted living and other residential care settings. Most of our work is carried out through policy analysis and systems advocacy both in our home state of New York and nationally. Uh, but more and more, we've been doing programs uh, such as this to educate consumers and families, uh, long-term care ombudsmen, advocates, uh, caregivers, including uh, nursing home care staff and assisted living care staff and other stakeholders. Uh, joining with me today, as I mentioned before, is Dara Valanajad. He joined the Coalition and the Center for Medicare Advocacy. We share him with the center in 2017. I assume I got that right, Dara. And I, of course, joined the coalition in 2002, and I've been executive director since 2005. So what are we going to be talking about today? I'm going to provide a brief background on, uh, very brief, on just nursing home quality standards and industry government relationship to kind of set things up. Um, talk a little bit about how nursing homes are paid. Both of these things, frankly, could be the subject of their own program, so I'm going to be really brief. But if people are interested, let us know, and we could do more on, um, on this. As we'll talk, things are going to be changing this year in terms of nursing home reimbursement. It's an issue that we've done a lot of work on over the years, uh, trying to improve the uh, quality through the reimbursement system and trying to help people understand how reimbursement works. This program today is really focused on looking at, you know, trying to get some insights into where the money goes in terms of profitability and accountability. So it's a little bit different, but we'd be happy to speak more about these uh, related issues in the future. Uh, we're also going to talk about some consumer concerns uh, related to, again, where the money, where does the money go? And then Dara is going to take it from there, talking about some of the federal information that MedPAC um, reports to Congress on nursing home profitability and finances and some other issues, you know, consumer perspectives on occupancy and care, as well as our recommendations. So uh, without further ado, just to get started, we, um, you know, in a nutshell, so to speak, uh, most nursing homes, as we've discussed before, those of you who have been on past programs, and many of you, of course, I'm sure know, um, almost every nursing home in the country and virtually every nursing home in our home state of New York participates in Medicare and or Medicaid. And when uh, someone participates or a facility participates in Medicare or Medicaid, it means that they are agreeing to meet or exceed the federal minimum standards of care in order to receive payments for services to Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. Importantly, uh, even though the law and the regulations uh, speak to Medicare or Medicaid, 
the standards apply to everybody in the facility, no matter who pays for their care. Uh, so the standards come from this method of payment, this method of, of um, requirements under the law, and the nursing reform law, of course, uh, but they apply to everyone in the facility. I think an important aspect of this also is that participation in Medicare or Medicaid is entirely voluntary. Nursing homes are not forced to participate in Medicare and Medicaid. They can be private pay, but as I mentioned before, the vast majority of nursing homes do participate in Medicare and Medicaid because that's where the money is, that's where uh, most people have coverage through Medicare or Medicaid or their private insurance will uh, may only pay for care in a licensed facility, a facility, excuse me, that's licensed under Medicaid or Medicare. So that's the standard, uh, but it's important to note that it's entirely voluntary. No one has to own a nursing home, and once they own a nursing home, they don't have to participate in Medicare or Medicaid. So that's why, from our perspective, adherence to the minimum standards is so important. Uh, of course, they're important because they protect people, and we want people to be able to access care that is good, that treats them with dignity, et cetera, but the, uh, that's all predicated on this voluntary, uh, voluntary uh, on the part of facilities to participate in these programs and their voluntary agreement. Again, I can't say it enough uh, to meet those standards. I also wanted to mention that the federal agency, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, it oversees nursing home care, so they develop the regulations and they enforce the regulations and they also pay for care. And in turn, CMS contracts with the states to both make the payment to nursing homes and to provide oversight. And those uh, state agencies are called state survey agencies. They are um, quite often, as they are in our state of New York, Department of Health or Department of Public Health, uh, et cetera. So I just wanted to give people essentially a lay of the land. Again, participation in Medicare or Medicaid is entirely voluntary on the part of the facility. So when they take that money, they agree to provide all the services that we've talked about in prior programs that we talk about in all our materials, the services that people, um, you know, residents need to attain and maintain their highest ability, uh, both clinically and emotionally, socially, et cetera. So how do we pay for nursing home care? We talk a little bit, not too much, about some of the um, essential points that underlie nursing home care. Nursing home payment is really complex. As I mentioned earlier on, we could spend uh, you know, a program just talking about uh, how nursing homes are paid and different methodologies and the strengths and weaknesses of those methodologies. We could spend a lot of time talking about Medicare and Medicaid. And as again, as I mentioned before, the system will be changing later on this year. We'll talk a little bit about these things, but I just wanted to be very clear that we are not going into significant depth uh, on these issues. I just more want to give you kind of a lay of the land today of um, how things work. So, you know, the way I think about it is that there are different ways in which we can pay for nursing home services or really for, for any kind of, you know, any kind of services provided on a daily basis. So you could pay someone a set fee per day. For instance, just to use this as a, an example, uh, paying nursing homes $100 a day to take in residents. And then the second model that I have here is what we call case mix reimbursement, and that's based upon the needs of the residents in the facility. Most states use a case mix reimbursement system. So what that means essentially is that a resident comes in, they have um, different needs, those needs are, are identified through an assessment, uh, a plan of care is laid out through care planning, all these are required under the federal requirements, and based upon the services provided, the nursing home 
gets paid prospectively um, for those for those services. And then lastly, I put here uh, what we call value-based purchasing. Sometimes we also refer to it as pay for performance. It's a trend that we've seen in recent years, and that is to kind of shape the way payment is made to encourage better care. So for instance, if a facility has um, improvement or a facility is one of the higher performers on a certain measure, uh, could be uh, rehospitalization. You know, going back to a hospital from a nursing home is one measure that's very often used. Uh, it could be giving people uh, inoculations. There, there are different measures that, that can be chosen, and the policymakers, both on the state and the federal level, uh, might choose some of those to, uh, as a way to encourage nursing homes to improve. So we have the set fee per day, say $100 per day, we have based upon the needs of the residents, so maybe that would range from, just to, you know, to carry out my example, from $75 a day for someone who had low needs to $150 a day for someone who had very high needs to compensate facilities for those needs. Excuse me. Or on top of either one of those, you could have a value-based purchasing where, or pay for performance where you are giving facilities uh, more money or taking away money uh, based upon their good or poor performance on a specific quality measure. The way that this plays out, I mean, there are strengths and weaknesses to all of these models. So if I was paying a nursing home, or if my state was paying a nursing home, say $100 a day for every resident, well, that results in the incentive for a nursing home not to accept people who have higher needs. Uh, and again, to, you know, to continue with our example, is that if I take in a resident, uh, Mrs. Albert, and she only um, requires about $60 a day in services, uh, you know, including food and staffing needs and, and, and medication and whatever, et cetera, uh, then I have a profit of $40 off of her. Um, whereas if I also have Mr. Alvarez coming in from the hospital and Mr. Alvarez is on a, maybe on a ventilator, uh, maybe he is a bar bariatric person, he's um, um, very overweight, uh, maybe he has diabetes and other comorbidities, and the cost of his care would be $150 a day, then I would lose $50 if I took in Mr. Alvarez based upon a set fee per day system. So that's why, as I said before, so many states moved to a case mix system because under a case mix system, they would get paid if it cost um, $80 to, to care for, um, for Ms. Jones, I think I changed her name, pardon me, uh, then um, you know, I would get maybe $120. If it cost $150 to care for Mr. Alvarez, maybe I'd get $170. So therefore I have an incentive to take in Mr. Alvarez, to take in people who have higher needs based upon what we call uh, a case mix, you know, the mix of the needs of the residents in the facility, again, based upon the resident assessment and, the, and their care planning. So I hope that makes it somewhat clear. The, the problem with the case mix system, again, the problem with the fee per day is that nursing homes have an incentive to take in easier residents and not take in or kick out residents who have higher needs because their compensation is set at the same amount no matter who they take in. With the case mix system, the what we call a perverse incentive is that nursing homes then have an incentive to have and to keep, in fact, residents sicker because if a resident has um, is not improving, you know, well, if a resident continues to have you know, significant need, then I can continue to receive uh, additional or more money for that person. So that is what we call a perverse incentive that, you know, rather than uh, wanting to provide or being incentivized 
to provide better care uh, and more services so that the person gets better and becomes more able to do things, then I have a perverse incentive to keep, keep people in need of more services so that I keep on getting more money. I'm certainly not saying that everyone does this. I'm, I'm talking about what the system provides, um, what the system provides for and how the system awards or uh, penalizes nursing homes under the different settings. Uh, so then, you know, several years ago, I would say probably, you know, actually now, you know, a couple decades ago, we started seeing a movement throughout healthcare, uh, first in, in the acute care, um, and now moving into long-term care and to nursing homes in the past 10 or so years, um, pay for performance or value-based purchasing. And what that entails is that I am going to, you know, it, it, it's, in essence, it's meant to overcome some of those perverse incentives. So uh, by saying that I'm going to give you more money if you help people get better. Uh, I'm, and one way of doing that, as I mentioned a little while ago, is that um, nursing homes could be paid more or hospitals could be paid more uh, for reducing rehospitalization. So that once someone comes out of the hospital, uh, that they don't come back into the hospital because, as I'm sure you all know, hospital care is extremely expensive and also dangerous to people. So in terms of being more efficient, saving money, and in terms of providing hopefully better care, the value-based purchasing models, they are uh, trying to incentivize facilities to do better. This is something, frankly, that we um, supported about you know, 10, 15 years ago. It seemed to make sense to us, excuse me, that you would pay for, for uh, encouraging quality. And on its face, I think it does make sense to say that you would pay for encouraging quality. The problem is, in practice, that you cannot choose every type of indicator for measuring that. And that can lead to nursing homes or other types of providers focusing on, you know, chasing the money essentially, focusing on those, um, those areas in which they are going to be measured for the value-based purchasing system. And to get back to my example, which is, is commonly used now uh, in, in, in federal reimbursement and in state reimbursement, is the rehospitalization. Well, if you are... Um, if you are the um, Pretty Gardens nursing home and I am going to give you an extra $100,000 a year uh, potentially based upon your, your hospital readmission rates, keeping them below, um, below the state average, well, that gives me an incentive to not send people to the hospital including possibly people who need to go to the hospital, people who really need to be there. Um, so that's, again, another perverse incentive. From my perspective, frankly, as an advocate, as someone who's researched these issues for a number of years now, I feel like these, these differences in the payment systems as we're moving along um, from set fee to case mix to value-based purchasing and other ways of trying to tweak reimbursement is that essentially we are trying to, or the government is trying to stay ahead of the industry or people in the, or, or providers in the industry that are gaming the system, that are uh, in the set fee, that we're not taking in people with higher needs, that in the case mix, maybe we're not helping people to get better. Uh, and the value-based, focusing on only specific value-based uh, criteria rather than the whole care for the resident. Again, what the nursing home reform law requires is that the resident is able to retain and maintain his or her highest practicable well-being. So uh, from my perspective, again, over the years, is that the federal government and you know the states that are implementing some of these different models, it's really trying to stay ahead of the industry, which has become increasingly sophisticated in its ability to measure where the money is coming from, how it's coming in, and how to maximize it. Again, this is not certainly not every nursing home. Um, 
it's uh, certainly not every administrator by any stretch of the imagination. I know administrators who are very dedicated uh, and nursing homes that are doing a good job. Uh, however, uh, for too many nursing homes, for too many residents in, in far too many nursing homes, in my opinion, the, um, the industry has again just become so sophisticated that in the absence of enforcing the minimum standards of care to which every individual is entitled, in the absence of enforcement, we, we are just chasing the dollar and we're just re trying to rejig the system in a way that I don't think is ever going to, to work effectively and efficiently and safely uh, in the absence of meaningful enforcement of those standards. So I also wanted to give a few specifics about the models of payment that you may be aware of, uh, in particular Medicare and Medicaid. And most importantly, I know many people know this distinction, but, but many don't, is that Medicare, on the right-hand side, if you look at the, at the uh, slide in orange, Medicare pays only for short-term rehab. It does not pay for long-term care. Medicaid, on the other hand, pays for most long-term care in nursing homes. As I note here, it covers about 60% of nursing home residents nationwide. Um, I didn't want, as I said earlier on, I don't want to go into too much detail because we could spend a lot of time. We can certainly talk about some of these things. Let us know, please. You can email us at info at ltccc.org if you, um, you know, need some help or want some more information uh, or have a suggestion for a future program. But I provided here some where I got some of the data for this presentation was at a website I use quite often, the Kaiser Family Foundation kff.org. It's a great resource for um, who, who, who's getting care in different states, how they're getting it, uh, how much is being paid for, the differences between care that's paid for in nursing homes versus outside of nursing homes, etc. Uh, lastly, in terms of Medicaid, the average payment rate, this is a, a national average, is $206 per day uh, for Medicaid, as of this, these are 9, 2017 data, excuse me. So Medicaid pays on average for long-term care $206 per day. Medicare, which pays again for short-term rehab, pays on average $503 a day. And, that, and both of these figures can vary. The Medicare in particular varies significantly from, you know, I've seen in the 400s, I've seen up to uh, over $800 per day per resident for care. Why is, it there, is there this distinction? Because Medicare residents are expected to be receiving a lot of individualized rehabilitation services. It's short-term rehab. That's why there is this difference. And I also want to mention quickly, uh, and again, we could talk about this more in a future program, that starting this October, the entire country is moving to a new payment system for Medicare uh, nursing home reimbursement called PDPM, Patient Driven Payment Model, Model, excuse me, in which payment is going to be based on what the resident needs rather than the services provided. That's a, again, a very simplistic, over, overly simplistic way of saying it. Uh, Daryl will talk a little bit more about it and we can certainly report back to you and discuss more of this in future, um, in future programs. I strongly encourage and welcome you to join us. Uh, we don't share anyone's name or email address, but we do send alerts and updates when things come up, and certainly we'll be talking a lot about this and providing a lot of information to the public. So if you want to hear about it, uh, join us, info at ltccc.org, or if you go to our website, nursinghome411.org, uh, about LTCCC on the bottom, you can join there. Again, we don't sell your name, we don't use your name for other purposes. It's really just to get information out there when there's new information available. So I'm going to talk a bit about some of the consumer concerns. I think you, you've heard a little bit about uh, some of my concerns, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. Um, so the question is, you know, do the provider claims that they need more money hold up? Uh, and one thing that always strikes me is that 
the nursing home industry as a whole is becoming increasingly for profit, meaning that uh, in the past we had uh, more nursing homes that were run by counties or the state government agencies uh, or were run as not for profits. Uh, sometimes they were Jewish or, or, or Catholic or Christian nursing homes. Uh, sometimes they were just run by other nonprofit community based organizations that were investing in what was often elder care, uh, you know, care for their uh, care for their communities. And to us, those are really important things. I um, am always sorry to see, frankly, even though um, it, it's not a, a always a um, absolute distinction between the not for profits and the for profits uh, and the government facilities. Government and not-for-profits tend to put more of the money they receive into resident care, into staffing. Sorry, that's my dog Zelda, who's chomping on her squeaky toy. Uh, hello, Zelda. Uh, so I, it, it troubles me to see, frankly, as someone who's concerned about the public welfare, to see this movement, uh, greater movement towards for-profit. Now, again, to be clear, and, and, and some of those uh, people and facilities I spoke about that are, I think are doing a good job, they are run by for-profit. And when I do research uh, for, you know, on a community or state level, I will quite frequently see for-profit facilities that are up there with higher, you know, amongst the highest staffing, uh, amongst the highest ratings, and the same can be, or the, the, the converse can be said for not-for-profit. Sometimes you see that the not-for-profits are um, are not the best facilities in the state either. So that can really vary. Again, I'm just talking some general terms. And of course, there's been some really good reporting in USA Today and, and other um, other news media about some of the things going on in veterans facilities that residents are uh, receiving. Some residents, I should say, are um, receiving poor care there as well. But the point here that I wanted to make is that we are seeing over the years, we've seen in my career and, and, and over the past 40 years before I started working in this field, that for -profit is, uh, the for-profit sector is increasing. And as you can see here, um, two-thirds of nursing homes now are owned for profit I mean, and operated for profit. And the reason why I think this is so important is, as I note here, would you invest in an industry in which you would lose money? I think that the answer that everyone would say is no. So if nursing homes are claiming that they need more money in order to provide good care, um, maybe they need more money. I mean, we would all like to have more money, certainly. Uh, everyone I know, uh, everyone that I can think of would like to have more money. Uh, certainly caregivers would like to have more money. Uh, but do they need to have more money in order to meet the basic standards of care? Well, um, if the for-profits are, uh, are buying it up, if people who are out there, uh, companies, uh, family-owned businesses, etc., they are not doing it, I don't believe. Uh, because they want to lose money. That just wouldn't make sense. So is, it, is what they're saying, as I noted before, to provide a claim that they need more money holds up, or is the nursing home industry holding us up? That's, um, that's my concern. So that for decades, nursing home industry lobbyists have responded to concerns about abuse, about neglect, about substandard care in far too many facilities as identified by GAO reports, government accountability reports, by inspector general reports, by academic reports, by reports that my organization has done. Um, that they make these claims that, or in response to um, concerns, they claim that they suffer Medicaid losses and are have raised it in margins. Those are just some of the quotes that I've gotten from the provider industry um, news magazines um, in you know, recent months. But it's things, frankly, that I've seen when I read uh, from congressional testimony from the 70s and from the 80s and from the 90s to the same thing over and over again, that the nursing home industry lobbyists 
are saying anytime they're saying you need you know you, too many residents are being harmed, too many residents are suffering uh, from pressure ulcers, from antipsychotic drugging, from um, physical restraints, uh, etc. They say, oh, you know, we you know we we can't hire more staff. Um, we, we, we're operating on razor thin margins. We're facing losses on our Medicaid residents. I see this more and more in, re, in reporting uh, in Rhode Island and other states where some nursing homes are now folding that they um, that they're operating at a loss. I hear this over and over again. Uh, well, what does that mean? Um, what what is that based on? Uh, meanwhile, we have residents, again, as I said at the start and as I say, I think in every program, who come in be to a nursing home because they expected that the promise under the federal law would be fulfilled, and that's not happening. Uh, and what we believe, as I, as I also note here below in the blue, is that the lack of transparency in terms of where does the money go, the lack of accountability for both the use of the money and lack of accountability for meeting minimum standards renders these claims pretty meaningless as far as far as we're concerned. So how can you say that you're operating as a loss if we don't have a very strong idea of where the money is going and that there's good accountability for how that's happening? So I'm going to provide an example here of a, um, a nursing home. We in, in New York State, which is our home state, we track um, you know uh, pretty closely, or as closely as we can, the proceedings of the Public Health and Health Planning Council in New York. Now, most states, and I think I'll, I'm going to skip ahead to the next slide. Do I have it over here? Oops, sorry about that. Okay, I'm going to go back. Um, most states um, review. The, um, the finances that nursing homes report, as I, as I know here actually, uh, when there is a proposed purchase of a nursing home, when a nursing home proposes to expand, usually that means adding beds, uh, or there's a new build, you know, building of a new nursing home, is that a, most states have a review process that um, is actually, again, I don't want to get into it, but actually it's something that industry people as far as I know, tend to strongly support because it limits the number of facilities that can be opened and operated in any state. Um, so what happens is you have a, a what's called the certificate of need process is that when someone wants to buy a facility, when somebody wants to build the facility, they have to file with the state and states have different levels in which is really up to the state in which they can review the owner for that owner's past history as a nursing home owner of other facilities um, or, um, or of the facility that they're planning to expand and also look at the finances of both that owner's um, current facilities, previous facilities, and the facility that is up for sale. Uh, and included in that review can, and as far as we are concerned, should be whether the character and competence, as we call it here in New York, whether the experience that the public has had with that owner has been a good one. Has that owner been found to be following the law? Is that owner investing some of the money it receives or he or she receives in staffing and in services that residents need? What, what, are the, uh, what is the experience that the public has in, in those owners' facilities in terms of important issues like pressure ulcers, like uh, staffing, of course, uh, like the use of antipsychotic drugs, like other indicia of quality. So again, I'm going to talk a little bit about one example. This is from the agenda of the last meeting of our New York State Public Health and Health Planning Council in regard to an owner's proposal to, it's a chain owner, to close two of its facilities and to expand a third facility in the same county uh, to, uh, in essence, to compensate, at least in terms of beds, for, that, that, for the other facility's closure. I mentioned before, and I just want to make sure that I, I don't, um, uh, don't forget about it, the reason why I said that I think that the industry tends to support this. I know that they did in Florida recently when there was some proposal to end 
the certificate of need process is because it limits the number of providers that can own or operate a facility. It limits the amount of competition that an owner can have. And that's why, uh, from my understanding at least, the industry or many in the industry tend to support having a certificate of need process on a state level. So this information is uh, information that I got from the um, state website. All this is public information. Uh, you can find it. If you have any question about it, let me know. But it's all on the New York State Department of Health's website under the, uh, under the agenda and attachments for the program from last week of New York State Public Health and Health Planning Council. I just want to be clear, these aren't numbers that I'm making up. These are numbers that are actually taken from documents that the nursing home owner provided. Uh, so they provide they provided for us past reported profits for this nursing home, which again they owned, and I, I graphed it out here below so you can see. But in 2015, they reported roughly $79,000 in profits. A year later, they reported close to $2 million in profits. And the year after that, 2017, they reported a bit over $2 million in profits. And then in order, when, they, when a facility is purchased, New York also requires that the facility um, provide expected future income uh, and, and expenses. And this perspective, well, this owner, I should say, the perspective is that they're going to be expanding. They expected future profits to be, uh, in the first year, eight, $5,820,000 and in year three, over $6 million. So we went from, again, these are numbers, past reported, it was what was reported by the, by the facility itself, uh, profits from 79,000 in 2015 to 1,980,000 in 2016 to 2,051,000 in 2017. And then once, they, once this um, plan goes through as expected, they expect to get five over five million in future profits in year one, and a little over six million in year three. So clearly, clearly, I mean, this shows that the profits are there. This is not every single facility, of course. This is one facility. It's the most recent purchase. Uh, it wasn't cherry picked from a whole bunch. It was, I think, the only nursing home that was actually. Um, that I noticed, at least, that was on the agenda for our Public Health and Health Planning Council uh, in this month's meeting. And so this was this is the information we're working with. Certainly, other facilities would report different profits or, or losses. So I also want to mention a bit about the quality for this nursing home that this owner owns and will continue to own is now asking the state to expand. So it has an overall, this, is, this graphic is from Nursing Home Compare and the data from Nursing Home Compare, uh, the federal website. It has a three-star overall rating on Nursing Home Compare, which is average. However, and this is really important for those of you who have been on our prior programs about Nursing Home Compare and ratings, it's star ratings. Star ratings are calculated based upon health inspection, staffing, and quality measures. Its health inspection and its staffing ratings are both two stars below average. The reason why this facility has a three-star rating is that it has five stars in quality measures. Quality measures are almost all, not all of them, but almost all of them are self-reported by facilities and unaudited by either the state or the federal governments. So they are not something to which I generally give a lot of credence. In addition, we also, um, as many of you know, track the payroll-based care staff and report on that. The latest care staff reporting, which we just reported, I think, last week, actually, for the last quarter of 2018, the latest federal data, so that this nursing home is providing 3.3 hours of total care staff hours per resident per day, excuse me, and total RN care staff hours of 0.3 per resident per day. Um, both of those are very low. Federal recommendations are 4.1 hours overall 
um, federal minimum recommendations, I should say, are, are 4.1 hours um, for overall and uh, about 0.75 hours for RN. Those are actually old recommendations and um, I would say if we looked at it now, it would, it would be um, a bit higher if we reassessed. But in any case, looking at 2001, um, you know, the federal study showed that you really need to have for the typical resident 4.1 hours overall and about 0.55 to 0.575 for just RN staff time per resident per day. This facility has uh, half, of the, half of that for RN care staff time. I also want to mention in terms of the financing is that it strikes strike me as an advocate that when I um, read about things online, when I read about things in, uh, in newspapers, when I go to Washington or to my state capital in Albany, there is always an enormous, enormous provider nursing home industry presence. So I looked it up, the um, Nursing Home Industry Lobby Associ Association, there are two main associations on both the federal and the state level. Um, Leading Age provides um, lobbying you know, or is the uh, association for nonprofit providers and ACA, the American Healthcare Association, is the association for, um, the principal association for for-profit providers. Uh, in New York State, by the way, for those of you who are in New York, uh, New York State Health Facilities Association, NISHPA, is the APCA affiliate. So I, I looked at their, um, again, this is publicly available data through IRS 990 forms for 2017 or 2016, uh, as well as other information that was provided on the foundation um, website. The um, leading age, the federal office, this is for the not-for-profits, they have over $38 million in assets. The American Healthcare Association has over $31 million in assets. Millions of dollars are being spent every single year to lobby for nursing home companies, nursing home owners, and their interests. Uh, in our state in New York, and you can get these data online, um, for any single, any other state. Uh, in our state, leading age has over $5 million and ACA, uh, or NISHPA, I should say, has close to $6 million in assets. The federal leader of leading age made well over $400,000 in income. Um, the federal leader of ACA made close to $2 million in income and additional compensation in 2017. New York State, again, we see something um, comparably similar. The New York State leader's income in 2000, I believe this, this was also 2017, uh, was over $300,000 from leading age and from related organizations. And the uh, New York State for-profit uh, provider association affiliate was uh, well over $600,000 for the principal uh, of that that organization, so a lot, a lot of money going into um, supporting the interests not of nursing home residents necessarily, but of the nursing home providers. Uh, and I think lastly, before I move on to Dara, is you know our concern, as I've mentioned a little bit, you know here and there, is the, is the lack of financial accountability. And Dara will talk a little bit about this more as well. Is that one? Um, there is a lack of accountability in terms of sales, in terms of separation of real estate assets. So a lot of nursing homes we see, they're owned by other, other parties or related parties. So it could be that the owner um, of the nursing home also has a limited liability company of which he or she is the principal, and that company owns the real estate assets. So it used to be that a nursing home, of course, owned the property and the building, et cetera. And that was part of what we were, you know, what we understood we were paying for. What happened is that some nursing homes, not all of them, but some of them have been selling the underlying property, could be, again, to a related, could be to themselves, essentially, or to a related party or some, someone else. Uh, they make the profit off of that, and then they, in turn, are paying 
the, um, they're paying rent to whoever that is, could be themselves, could be to someone else, but that money comes out of the reimbursement that we pay them to provide care. Uh, there are, secondly, there are no limits on related party agreements. So in addition to potentially owning the property that you're paying yourself, to which you're paying yourself rent or for which you're paying yourself rent, you can also have other agreements for laundry services, for management services, for, um, uh, you know, for lawn services, uh, etc. There is no accountability whatsoever for efficient contracting, for it being a reasonable amount uh, in the area in which you live when you contract with yourself or with someone else. I remember this was actually a not-for-profit facility um, in Brooklyn when I when I first started that the person who was the administrator was paying her son a uh, million dollars a year for contract services for the two nursing homes she was running. And they were terrible nursing homes. They, one of them closed, I believe. The other one still exists. It's still a nursing home that's often amongst the um, worst in the country. It's been a special focus facility several times. Uh, meanwhile, um, that, that nursing home and its sister nursing home was paying the son of the administrator a million dollars a year for computer services while people were sitting in their own wastes. Uh, and I know people in those nursing homes who have been sitting in their own ways. So I'm not making that up. Um, so that is, you know, the concern that we have is that there is um, not only, uh, you know, lack of accountability, but the lack of accountability can lead to hidden profits and to money going where we don't know where it goes and who it benefits. I'm going to turn it over to Dara now. Uh, Dara, can you click yourself on? If you press star six. I, I, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, Richard. Um, perfect. Uh, so I will be providing an um, overview of the current state of the nursing home industry uh, from the perspective of, Met, of MedPAC, and then I'll speak to the type of care that residents are too often experiencing across the country, um, and then I will provide an overview of one proposal that we believe may help reconcile the positive experience that the industry is seeing with the really negative experience that residents often face. So just to provide a little background about MedPAC, um, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, MedPAC, um, is an independent congressional agency that advises Congress on the Medicare program. MedPAC provides Congress with an analysis of access to care, quality of care, and other relevant topics. Uh, MedPAC issues two annual reports in March and June of each year, outlining the Commission's overall findings, findings and suggestions. So this part of the presentation will focus on MedPAC's most recent report to Congress, the March 2019 report, um, and I will discuss the Commission's findings. Overall, the MedPAC report paints a um, pretty optimistic picture for nursing operators. The report shows that this multi-billion dollar industry continues to thrive in markets across the country, benefiting from high Medicare margins and increasing Medicaid reimbursement rates. So in 2017, roughly 15,000 nursing homes provided services to 1.6 million beneficiaries in, tra in traditional Medicare alone, with an overall cost of $28.4 billion to the program. Uh, the median per day rate was $480, um, and the median payment for the entire state was over $18,000. MedPAC finds that the number of nursing homes remained steady in 2018. While there have been a number of facility closures across, across the country, um, the new number of facilities opening have actually remained higher. Uh, moreover, 89% of beneficiaries um, live in counties with three or more nursing homes, and only less than 1% live in an area with no nursing home option. The entry of new for-profit nursing homes shows that operators' access to capital is adequate. As MedPAC states, many lenders remain optimistic about this sector. Capital markets are reported to be robust with tremendous investor demand, even though facilities' total margins are low and occupancy rates have declined. And we will be discussing the total margin and occupancy rates in just a moment. But first, I want to note that MedPAC finds that 
although some larger national chains may be exiting the market, smaller regional investors have been able to pick up those services um, as a result of all the available capital, of all the available interest in this market. Um, in fact, in fact, MedPAC adds that these smaller operators may have a better competitive advantage because they are more familiar with the communities, um, hospital referral patterns, and individual facility performance. Uh, next slide, please, Richard. So now about those margins. Um, in 2017, the aggregate Medicare margin for freestanding facilities was 11.2%. And this was actually the 18th consecutive year that Medicare margins were above 10%. Uh, in fact, MedPAC argues that Medicare reimbursement, if anything, needs to be lowered uh, to more closely align with the cost of care. So while the nursing home industry may argue that low Medicaid rates are one of the reasons why nursing homes are going out of business, MedPAC's report documents that overall Medicaid rates are actually increasing. MedPAC finds that spending on Medicaid-funded nursing home services totaled over $43 billion in 2017 alone. And while 17 states uh, may have froze or restricted Medicaid rates in 2018, the majority, 34 states and the District of Columbia, increased their rates. MedPAC notes that more states increased their Medicaid rates in 2018 than in the previous year. And in 2019, 40 states uh, including D.C., um, have indicated that rates will again increase. According to the National Investment Center for ha uh, Seniors Housing and Care, the Medicaid per day revenue has been steady um, and increasing since 2011. So together, the total margins, um, so including Medicare and Medicaid, in 2017 was 0.5%. However, as MedPAC makes clear, the total margin reflects all lines of businesses, and that includes nursing home care, home health, hospice, and investment income to name just a few. So I would really caution against focusing on the total uh, margin here, given that it does not represent so solely nursing home services. Notably, Med MedPAC suggests that one reason why nursing homes are experiencing a decline in revenue is lower occupancy rates. The low occupancy rate may be linked to the poor quality of care that nursing um, residents too often experience, um, as Richard has mentioned. Um, next slide, please, Richard. Um, sadly, it is not surprising to learn that individuals too often do not want to go to nursing homes and may actually choose a lower level of care or no care, despite their actual care needs, just to avoid it. To help illustrate the current state of the nursing home um, care that residents are experiencing, I want to highlight our Elder Justice What No Harm Really Means for Residents newsletter that we published jointly with the Center for Medicare Advocacy. So when nursing homes violate residents' rights and protections, state surveyors identify the majority of these violations, over 95%, as causing no harm to the resident. This failure to recognize resident pain, suffering, and humiliation when it occurs means that nursing homes are not held accountable for violations through financial penalties. We find that nursing homes may have little incentive to correct the underlying causes of resident abuse, neglect, and other forms of harm when there's little to no financial penalty. A recent report by the U.S. Department of Health Office of the Inspector General highlights that about 31% of nursing homes across the country um, had at least one repeat deficiency. The Office of the Inspector General liberally defines repeat deficiency as a deficiency type that was cited at least five times in separate surveys. Because of such inadequate enforcement, residents too often continue uh, to experience the consequences of these violations, such as bruising and broken bones, while the facility only receives an insignificant punishment. So for example, all the following deficiencies uh, I'm about to um, um, list were cited as no harm. A New York nursing home physically restraining a resident without a documented medical system and resident uh, reassessment, that was no harm. A Kansas nursing home administering an antipsychotic drug to a resident without first attempting any non-pharmacological interventions, no harm. A Michigan nursing home leaving a resident unsupervised resulting in another resident with dementia being sexually assaulted, no harm. An Illinois facility 
inadequate um, housekeeping and maintenance resulted in a maggot infestation on a resident's scrotum. Again, no harm. A Michigan facility's failure to develop a baseline care plan um, resulted in improper catheter use and bright red blood on a resident's genitals. Again, no harm. These citations uh, represent only the small sliver of the hundreds of thousands of no harm deficiencies um, cited over the last few years. Despite the systemic under enforcement that already exists, the Trump administration is continuing to take further action to dismantle meaningful enforcement and lower the quality of care residents are receiving. Next slide, please. So for example, CMS's most recent proposed rulemaking would likely lower the quality of resident care by placing even more residents at risk of not receiving individualized therapy. On April 25th, CMS issued proposed rulemaking revising the definition of group therapy in skilled nursing facilities. The proposed change will allow nursing homes to have six residents rather than four residents participate in a single group therapy session. This change is contrary to CMS's previous position that, quote, largely that large groups such as those of five or more participants can make it difficult for the participants to engage with one another over the course of the session. It is clear that providing therapy in a group setting is less costly for providers because it allows just one therapist to oversee the care of multiple residents at the same time. Given that reality, CMS does acknowledge that nursing homes have an incentive to place residents in group therapy, even though CMS makes clear that individual therapy is the preferred mode. Additionally, under the Patient Driven Payment Model, or PDPM, which will go into effect this October, Medicare reimbursement will no longer be driven by therapy minutes, but by, but by each resident's characteristics based on an initial assessment. This change may result in facilities placing residents in group therapy to pocket more of the Medicare reimbursement, a task that will be easier if the proposed rule allows them to include more residents in every group therapy session. Uh, while only 25% of each resident's total therapy regimen by discipline can be provided in a group or concurrent therapy setting, CMS will only give facilities a warning when they have exceeded group therapy limits. So in other words, CMS will not be meaningfully enforcing the group therapy limit, even though CMS specifically states that group therapy is a supplement individual therapy and not replace it. And I want to highlight this rule um, specifically because um, CMS is accepting comments until June 18th, and the coalition has actually written um, uh, comments with the Center for Medicare Advocacy outlining our concerns that I've just mentioned. Um, and if anyone is interested in having their organization sign on to this comment, uh, please do let us know and we will include you. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in light of the many reports indicating that nursing room operators are undertaking risky financial dealings that jeopardize resident care, and given that taxpayer dollars uh, finance the majority of nursing home care, uh, we are advocating for the implementation of a medical loss ratio for nursing homes. And this proposal is not as complicated as it sounds. The term more simply stated means that nursing home providers would be required to designate a certain percentage of taxpayer dollars towards actually providing direct resident care. Essentially, a medical loss ratio would serve as a check to the poor use of money in nursing homes. Medical, medical loss ratios actually already exist for health insurance companies. The Obama administration made it a requirement under the Affordable Care Act mandating that at least 80% of premium dollars be spent on medical care rather than administrative costs. In fact, one nursing home industry group has noted that um, the Affordable Care Act recognized the value of minimum medical loss ratio standards as a health reform measure in order to maximize that portion of premium spent on health care rather than administration and profits. We, along with um, other consumer advocacy organizations, argue that a medical loss ratio for nursing homes would work the same way by placing an appropriate cap on the amount of money that a nursing home may direct towards profit or administration thereby freeing up more money for direct care workers and thereby improving resident care. 
For more information about medical loss ratios, I highly encourage you to read our joint statement um, that we published with the Center for Medicare Advocacy, California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, Consumer Voice, and Justice in Aging. Uh, this statement provides a pretty good overview of why we need more accountability in nursing homes to know that taxpayer dollars are going to resident care and how a medical loss ratio could provide residents, families, and taxpayers with that accountability. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to Richard. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dara. That was really uh, informative to, for me and I hope for others as well. So I just wanted to mention, I, know we're, I think we're pretty much at, at our time, actually it's 2.02. So I wanted to mention some of the resources we have. Again, um, as Dara mentioned, well, actually say everything that Dara mentioned is on our website, nursinghome411.org. Uh, we have a Family and Amazon Resource Center there and uh, tools for resident center advocacy. We have a new crime reporting um, and crime and abuse reporting center as well. Coming up, our next program is going to be a recap of our symposium. Uh, hopefully, all of you um, know that we're having, though, at least those of you in the New York City area, that we are having a, or New York State area, we're having a symposium on June 17th in New York City. It's going to be a terrific program. Uh, Lindsay Heckler from um, from our own state of New York is going to be presenting on transfer and discharge protections, and we have Dr. Jonathan Evans coming in from Virginia, who is a extraordinary speaker on on dementia care. And uh, so we're going to be providing a recap of uh, some of that program at our next webinar on June 18th. And otherwise, I wanted to thank you all for joining us today. Before we end, and I'll open it up, we certainly will stay on for Q&A, is I just wanted to mention one of the things that, uh, one reason why I wanted to do the program on this topic today is uh, Clearly, for the issues that we raise about the need for uh, more accountability, for more transparency, for a reasonable uh, connection between payment and care for what is a very vulnerable population, but also because it has disturbed me to see so many news reports in which those um, you know nursing home um, representatives, the you know the industry lobbyists, associations, etc., are saying, "Oh, you know, um, you know, we have no money. We have no money. We have no money. We're running out of money. This is why nursing homes are closing." When again, uh, there there is pretty much no accountability for selling the underlying property, for how much you spend on different services, paying yourself for a different party, and so in the absence of that transparency and that accountability or on those issues, it's, you know, who's to say when someone mismanages their property? Who's to say when a owner essentially loots the uh, business and walks away, as, as we saw happen pretty recently in a number of states with the um, Skyline nursing homes, a, um, a tragedy for, for too many residents in, again, many states across the country. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention that I hear often from families, from residents, from long-term care ombudsmen, that they are being told by their facility, well, this, this is all they can afford to do, this is all, this is the only staff and they have enough money to pay for, et cetera. And I really want you, this is a bit of my, this is my own opinion, but I really want, I hope that this plugs in with you, that that is not a good reason. Again, as I said from the very start, nursing homes voluntarily agree to participate in Medicare and Medicaid um, based upon the amount of money that they receive and agree to provide, to meet or exceed all of the federal and any state standards. And when they don't do that, that is not our fault, period. Uh, so I'm going to open it up for questions. First, I'll see if anyone has written in. If, if you have any questions, please press star six, and we'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Well, thank you very much again. We appreciate your comments and questions. We don't have the capacity to help with individual cases, unfortunately. But, oh, so we might have a question. I'll check on that. Um, 
Okay, thank you. A nice comment from Peg Graham. Thank you. Um, one friendly amendment, not just about increasing staffing compensation, also about making sure that residents are getting the assistive devices they need, not just the cheapest. Absolutely. So that was a comment from, from Peg Graham. Uh, she wrote in, uh, and, and I agree. It's, you know, staffing is the most important, it, it, it's the biggest expense, and that's why facilities tend to cut back on it. But um, it's not the only expense. And, you know, sometimes I'm appalled when I hear, I heard recently of one, this was actually an adult home that was spending an average of two and a half dollars a day per resident on food. I mean, what kind of, what kind of food can you possibly provide for a human being um, that is palatable and nutritious for two and a half dollars a day? So it goes across the board, yes, that we would like to see um, the money, the money that we, the public invest, that we all invest, being spent to provide appropriate care. Uh, one other question, uh, do any states have a medical loss ratio for nursing homes or any restrictions on use of funding? Not, well, not to my knowledge does any nursing, does any state have a medical loss ratio. In terms of restrictions on use of funding, we've seen over the years, to my mind, they have not been very successful, but what they call wage pass-throughs uh, that different states have implemented. And what that means, in short, is that the uh, money is appropriated to the industry, but the um, the industry is supposed to, you know, nursing, it's given to nursing homes, and that money is supposed to go to, um, as, as it would imply, wage pass-through to wages for staff, to, you know, to money spent on staff. Um, but to my knowledge, those have not been very successful in terms of systemic improvement. And very short uh, answer to that is because if you're not accounting for how other monies are spent, then there's really very li little limiting a provider from pulling other money because they receive this additional compensation. Again, that, that's a very simplistic way of saying it, but I, um, uh, to my knowledge, those uh, wage pass-throughs have not been successful in systemically and for a long period of time helping improve resident care. So thank you all very much for joining us today. If you're in the New York City area and are interested in attending the, um, the program in June, please let us know ASAP. Uh, you can email info at ltccc.org. Uh, it's on June um, 17th, I believe, and then the following day we're going to be providing some of the lessons learned from the symposium um, on our webinar that day. Again, thank you very much. Have a great Memorial Day, and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dara, very much for a terrific presentation. Bye-bye now.